Municipal Council, uh, Bill Baker. Would you <laughs> lead us in a pledge? <laughs> Senior Boy Scout leader, too. Unless in uniform, hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance <laughs> to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Baker. <clears throat> all right. Well, the first item on here is a uh, presentation to one of our own, Mr. Whitaker. So, Fred, if you'd come on up here. And uh, if, if uh, one of our council members' suggestions, I think quite appropriately, if the council wants to come down and uh, stand here with us and maybe get in the picture and shake hands with Mr. Whitaker, maybe we get the whole council down here. Mm, that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. Okay.
next, do we have a report from the Villa Park Community Services Foundation? Oh, we have Rick. Yes, Mayor Barnett. Welcome. We to, pleasure to have you back. Good evening, Mayor Barnett, Mayor Pro Tem Fascinelli, and Council. I'm Rich Ulmer and happy to be here on behalf of the Villa Park Community Services Foundation. We have several exciting things to talk about this evening. And um, with Thanksgiving and Christmas approaching real fast, we ought to get started. December the 13th this year, a Saturday, Santa comes to Villa Park. His uh, traditional vehicle, the Orange County Fire Authority fire engine, will be carrying him. And he'll have lots of candy and uh, goodies for good boys and girls and photo opportunities for everybody. The uh, uh, streets schedule where the stops will be for the fire engine this year are on the Villa Park website, which is www.villapark.org. And if that's wrong, Jill will correct me. Is that wrong, Jill? Okay, the foundation website is VPCS Foundation, VPCSFoundation.org, and there you'll find also the forms <coughs> and the uh, routes as well as um, uh, the times for the uh, boat parade because that's next day. On Sunday, December 14th, there's a, a boat parade. It's the 17th annual Villa Park Dry Land Boat Parade this year with a spectacular name called Par Parade of Holiday D apostrophe Lights. So, Parade of Holiday Delights. Um, see that website that I just mentioned? That's vpcsfoundation.org. Uh, and uh, you'll, you'll have a chance if you have a boat. Oh, by the way, the definition of a boat in the Inland Boat Parade is anything that rolls. <laughs> anything that rolls. And you have 10 opportunities to win a trophy. Most original. I, I Go to the website, check it out, and uh, get involved. Um, with the boat parade as well as be ready for Santa on the Saturday before that. Now I'd like to look back a little bit uh, at the month of October where the Villa Park Community Services Foundation um, contributed to the quality of life here in a very unusual way. It was in October that we held a second uh, dog adoption day. Actually it was a half a day on a Saturday. And that's all it took in time for 10 dogs to find permanent homes that day. That was pretty spectacular because we had a lot of rescue groups, um, people from the Orange County Shelter, uh, some very um, experienced people, which we're not. Um, but 10 was the largest number of dogs adopted in any half day event that anybody could remember. So it was pretty spectacular. Uh, we found out at that event that the previous year we had had six dogs in our first year attempting to have dogs adopted. We had six dogs adopted, so 16 in two years which is just something to feel awfully good about. So join us, please, in feeling good about finding homes, permanent homes, for 16 dogs in just two events. And maybe next year, if you'd like to do something uh, uh, in the way of adopting a dog, we'd love to have you come out in October. Those of you who have dogs and having knocked <coughs> on every uh, door in Villa Park uh, uh, City twice, I can tell you that about half the people in Villa Park have dogs. And um, if you do, there's a dog walk usually held in January or February. We've only had one, and last year we had a real good turnout for first year, but we'd love to have you keep an eye out for our communications and join us in January or February this year for uh, a dog walk. It was cool. A lot of neighbors met one another, didn't even know they walked the same routes, and uh, agreed to meet at you know 9 o'clock the next morning kind of thing. So it was really fun. Recently, um, your foundation had a uh, planning-oriented <coughs> retreat. And in that retreat, we finalized a really strong 2015 budget, which um, I'd like to say has great emphasis on spending. And the reason I say that is it's in collaboration with City Monies, uh, the Women's League, and Rotary. And the focused areas are primarily beautification. As you know, Mayor Barnett started a couple of years ago with the idea um, of brightening up our, our entrances and exits, exits, the main ones to the city. And we've continued that, but it costs a lot of money. Each one of those costs tens of thousands of dollars. And the foundation wants to continue its effort, as it has from the beginning, joining the city and finding some monies with uh, Michelle's help and, and the council's help to continue this beautification effort. That's also known as increasing property values, by the way. That's something Villa Park residents are very interested in, very interested. We also need to upgrade our equipment. You know, the pop-ups for the picnics and things like that and the Halloween fest, things that we sponsor, the pop-ups are getting old and, and a little bit rickety, so we need to buy some new equipment. Also next year, the picnic, which has always been something you buy tickets for, 
you won't have to buy tickets next year. Foundation will pick up the uh, costs without any attempts at reimbursement through tickets. And we have a concert in the Villa Park, which Jill Cool I started a couple <coughs> of years ago, and we had the Beatles, and we've had uh, a couple of really spectacular events. And next year, uh, I'm sure it's going to be even better. But we're going to upgrade that, and, and it'll be in the month of August. Uh, we'll let you know when that happens, uh, when we fix a date and have our, our group, our tribute band lined up. <coughs> the other thing that uh, the retreat focused on was a very new program for seniors in Villa Park. I don't have a lot to tell you about that tonight because it's in its development stages. But I think the important thing about that for you to know is that we have 200 homes in Villa Park, more or less, uh, from the 2010 census, where there's a single uh, person alone and um, it's oftentimes a female, about two out of three times. But there are 200 of those homes in Villa Park. We don't want to be intrusive. We just want to make it possible for people to talk to one another, maybe develop a telephone or an email relationship, and let each other know that they're doing fine. So it's a, it's a program in the stage, as I said, of development, but it'll come along and please watch for communication from the foundation. And transitioning uh, back to the Dog Adoption Day and the senior program for a quick second, putting them together, these, these ideas came from members of the board or members of our community. The July 4 re-institution uh, of a parade, for example, this year, came from a, a relatively new person in Villa Park. She came to a foundation meeting and um, offered the idea, and the foundation sponsored that. So there are lots of things. Sometimes I ask a person, have they heard of the Villa Park Community Service Foundation? And they say, what foundation? They don't know what we do. And um, they've lived here quite a long time. So our goal next year will be to increase awareness, uh, to be at these council meetings a little bit more often than we have been. And um, um, I guess what I would like to say here is we're in our last of 2014 uh, membership drive, and we'd love to have you join if you're not a member. The uh, minimum membership is uh, $75, and we'll throw in a book for um, the history of Villa Park if you don't have one. So. Please um, contact somebody on the Villa Park Community Services Foundation um, or at City Hall. They'll help you. Our meetings are held the second Monday of every month at 6 o'clock right here in City Hall. So that's the update from the uh, Villa Park Community Services Foundation. And um, Any questions from Council? I'd just like to thank you and uh, say it's very nice to have you back. And for thank those you. of you that yeah. don't know Rich, he's... He was on council, he's donated and continues to donate an in, in, inordinate amount of time uh, for the benefit of the city. And in regard to your comments about the signs, I believe there are presently signs under construction right now there on are. Santiago and Collins and I think Meats in uh, Santiago. I haven't seen them, but uh, I understand they're going. Well, having been in a budget session or two over the eight years I was on council, I can share with you that uh, something you already know, and that is there's never enough money to do all the things that we would like to do as a city council and neither is there enough in the foundation, but together we can make uh, some nice <coughs> miracles, I think. So, thank you. We may be losing some more of that tonight, but thank you. Okay. Thank you, Richard. <coughs> the double report. Good evening. Got to tag on to that. One of the trophies for the boat parade, the upcoming boat parade. And now for my yearly song. It's beginning to look a lot like the Yacht Parade everywhere you go. Boats parked on the street for days, sheriffs looking the other way, ignoring the 72-hour parking law. <laughs> it's beginning to look a lot like the Yacht Parade. Soon the boats will sail down the streets of OVP, all happy as can be with garland and tinsel strung from stem to stern. There will be parties and people along the route, all shouting along the way, to town center where everyone goes, where everyone gets to play. It's beginning to look a lot like the yacht parade. Town center is all aglow. Entertainment for the night, vendors offering gifts just right and food and fun for everyone you know. It's beginning to look a lot like the Yacht Parade. Grand Marshal naming is here. It would be such a bummer not to see Rich and Bev Homer. 
as they light the Christmas tree. <laughs> it's beginning to look a lot like the yacht parade here in old BP. See you there. All right. scared to ask, is that the end of the uh, foundation presentations? <laughs> is there one more? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, not the foundation, but the Friends of the Library. I'm Bill McDonald, the president of the Friends of the Library, which has sponsored for 10 years now our 5K, 10K fun run, and which has been, I think, a very important, very spectacular success. It has helped us provide funds additional support for the library. A lot of people have worked very hard on that, but there is someone, especially here tonight, that doesn't usually get recognized. His organization does not usually get recognized for all that, all the burden we place on them when we have this race, uh, particularly uh, two years ago where there was really chaos because of very poor coordination. We had the race and there were actually multiple athletic events at the school, at the high school. So traffic was just an absolute disaster. So I would ask Lieutenant Bob Gunsel to stand up, please. I love asking a lieutenant to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, I want to present you with this plaque and I'll read it to you. The Friends of the Bill Park Library Inc. recognize Lieutenant Bob Gunsel of the Orange County Sheriff's Department for finding rational, logical, and creative solutions for the Villa Park Union Bank Friends of the Villa Park Library 5K, 10K run benefiting the Villa Park Library Saturday, June 22, 2013 and Saturday, June 21, 2014. We could not have done it without you and your crew. Yeah, Thank you, sir. <laughs> Okay, thank you, library. Uh, I guess it's time to hear from the Orange County Fire Authority. I'm going to be singing as well. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot of guts to run into a burning building, but I don't know. I think it takes more to stand up here and sing in front of city council and, and do a great job. Good. good evening, honorable mayor, uh, city council, city staff, members of the community. My name is Mike Schrader, battalion chief of the Orange County Fire Authority. I'm here to share just a couple things this evening. First, I wanted to share some great news. Uh, we recently um, sat our new fire chief, Jeff Bowman. Uh, he was our interim during, uh, from September on to this point. And then uh, just a few uh, days ago, we sat him as our permanent fire chief, which is a great, um, a great thing for us to move forward as, a, as an agency. So we're very excited about that after a nationwide search. Next, I wanted to uh, highlight our emergency services history call for the month. Uh, 29 calls for service within the city of Villa Park, pretty, pretty normal uh, level. All EMS service calls, floods, automatic alarms, things of this nature, no fires reported. Lastly, I wanted to just highlight uh, for council and citizens the importance of having a working smoke alarm on every floor and every living space. Um, my, uh, my wife and I have two small boys, and uh, we went around after our clocks changed two weeks ago and got the ladder out and put the new 9-volt in all our, our old smoke detectors. And it, it's a great reminder to folks, uh, staff, and, and council to do the same. Um, National Fire Protection Association did a study and they said that you reduce your risk over half by dying in a fire by just having a working smoke alarm. You further reduce your risk by once that smoke alarm goes off, you leave your home and never return until we say it's okay. Uh, as a former fire investigator, I'd been on multiple fatality fires that were 100% preventable had people just done those simple two things. So um, as we prepare to move into our home fire season, so to speak, with cooking and heating and electrical, um, it's very important to test your smoke alarms monthly, replace those batteries, and uh, you can even go onto our website, um, www.ocfa.org, and uh, we can get you some smoke alarms if you're unable to do that. So open any questions from council? We also have, a pro we also have <coughs> smoke alarms that were provided to us, I think, from the fire authority also. Right. And the rotary will come to your home and install them for you. So if you know anybody who needs the smoke alarms, if they can't come down, if they can't put them on, they will actually come down here, pick them up, and make an appointment with you and put them in to service that the Rotary does provide. 
Perfect. And you don't have to pay for the, the smoke and, alarms. And I believe either. those are 10-year battery life alarms. Too. Right, even better. Uh, the ones, I've, I've got eight in my house. I'm a fireman having your home burned down when you're a firefighter. is not cool. So I have eight in my house, and they're all old 9 volts. So uh, if you can get the 10-year, they're, they're much better. Now uh, Lieutenant Gunzel and I are going to sing a duet. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the offer, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass on. I'm gonna pass on that one. And now we have the sheriff's department update. Okay, uh, for the month of October, Part One crimes. Uh, a little disappointed that we have, for the first time this year, cracked the double-digit mark. Uh, we had ten uh, Part One crimes for October. Uh, for detail on that one, the uh, the first one, uh, if you follow on your list, the attempt. Uh, well, we have attempt bank robbery uh, over in the shopping center here. Um, was not a successful attempt, but I uh, did create quite the stir here. Um, and then we had four residential burglaries, um, <coughs> kitchen window uh, broken and residence ransacked. Uh, we had another one, a window smashed with the, uh, with the uh, house ransacked. The third one, uh, multiple kitchen appliances. Um, that one was a house under construction. There was no sign of forced entry, so what we think happened is uh, there was a key left for contractors and someone knew where that key was. They came in and took nothing but appliances and put the key back. In fact, there was no sign of forced entry on that one at all. And then the, uh, the fourth one, a suspect gained entry through an unsecured window or a door. And we lost on that was an iPad, <coughs> but, or excuse me, an iPod. Um, again, lock your doors and set your alarms. Uh, we had a vehicle burglary from the high school where someone had taken a uh, set of keys from the locker room and, and went to the, to the uh, parking lot and took something out of a car. Uh, two grand thefts. Uh, one was a trailer off of Dodson Way, and that trailer was subsequently recovered in the city. And then the trailer theft up on Rosenau Circle. Um, one petty theft on Santiago, and then one act of vandalism um, where someone threw a pumpkin out of a car. So... Um, Overall, the, the, trend, the trends are still down. We're at 61 part one crimes for the year. Uh, too much for my liking, but uh, we finished last year, 2013, at 102. So um, uh, hopefully we keep going the way we are and, and finish lower than last year. Um, I have a couple things I want to talk about unless anybody had questions about. I have, I have a question. Stuff. Did you say that the trailer that was stolen on Dotson was found in the city? Yes. It was. So on the stats, the stats that would that would actually double stat. They would have a, a loss and then a recovered stolen. So we count it as one. DOJ stats wants two, so we just count it as one one incident. You didn't happen to find my trailer there, did you? The one on Rose now we did not find. I, I was the other trailer, so uh, <laughs> Wow. Yeah, no, we did not find that one. Uh, I want to talk about, and just in the context of crime stats and, and crime data, uh, the effects of Prop 47, if you uh, allow me just one minute. Um, actually, the day after the election, our field training bureau came up with a training uh, bulletin showing the effects of Prop 47. Um, and I'll go over some of the things that, that are going to be affected, uh, all the different crimes are, that are under Prop 47. Uh, insufficient funds, forgery, petty thefts, receiving stolen property, all drug possessions that are uh, a personal use, and then they added a shoplifting statute. Um, basically, what all these things did, in, in a legal sense, um, there was a lot of crimes that were considered wobblers, and, and meaning it could be a felony or a misdemeanor. Uh, in that sense, it gave the DA a lot of uh, leeway on, on charging and jail time and things like that. And also gave, for in the case of drug crimes, uh, gave our investigators a lot of leeway. Uh, you know, working informants and things like that with <coughs> the threat of going to jail or giving us information on, on uh, you know, where information, uh, where drugs are coming from. So Prop 47, officially what it does is takes away the wobblers. So um, all those things become misdemeanors. Um, what, it, what the problem is, what didn't stay in the voter guide that most people don't read, um, that in order for a law enforcement officer to affect an arrest on a misdemeanor it has to be in his presence, his, his or her presence. So if one of these crimes didn't occur in my presence, I can't make a legal arrest unless we have someone sign a private person's arrest form, um, which means a victim of a crime, say for instance, uh, shoplifting, someone goes into one of the stores here at, at town center 
and unless it's over $950 a loss, then it's a misdemeanor crime. Uh, even if we catch them outside and they have it in their possession, what would normally be possession of stolen property, and we go to prison or jail for that, now it's a misdemeanor. Um, and furthermore, we have to have the victim, the shop owner, sign a private person's arrest warrant, making them the victim of the crime, and you know we have to go to court testifying that they're the victim. So anyway, it's created a lot of things on drug crimes, everything, heroin, um, which was a serious felony before is a misdemeanor now, methamphetamine, uh, anything personal use is a misdemeanor. So um, it will affect the, the crime stats, not so much the drug uh, things, and thank God the residential burglaries are still <coughs> felonies, uh, but it will affect you know the petty thefts and all the bank crimes, the forgeries and things like that. Um, I just wanted to bring you guys up to speed on what we're facing. If, if something happens, why deputies aren't taking um, action on some things, a lot of times we can't. So I just want to make sure I, I covered that before. And this is in effect right now. The last thing I'll say about Prop 47 is um, there's a, a possibility of up to 10,000 state prison inmates that are going to be appealing their cases, which means they could be coming back out on the street. So. <coughs> Um, if they were convicted under any of these crimes that are now misdemeanors. So, any questions for me about that? No, no questions, but I would just make a comment. Um, I'm sure many people in Villa Park uh, read the register, and it was reported, you know, Villa Park, from our standpoint, we outright rejected it, um, one of the highest percentages of any city um, in, in the state, quite frankly. Uh, and I think that's just because we recognize that this is not a good thing mm -hmm. for the people. Um, but I just think it's interesting that um, cities that don't tolerate crime and, and actually have less crime are the ones that were more likely to reject Prop 47 and those cities that have higher incidences of crime and even criminals living in it were more apt to actually approve it. So I thought that was an yeah. interesting uh, perspective. <coughs> Thank you for the report, as sad yeah. as it is. I, I think you'll see <coughs> when the new council seated, uh, I think you'll see a motion for a, uh, for a uh, crime prevention committee uh, to be established. So that's for anybody that's sitting out here in frustration. I'm not sure that'll solve all your problems, but I, I do think you're going to see a crime prevention committee formed. And I'd be happy to participate in that. Yeah, you, you can serve. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, do we have a neighborhood watch update representative? Mary? Yes, we do. Mary Silzel, 18202 Montana Circle. My husband assists me in this, but he is grandparenting tonight, so he's not here for the report. Um, the revitalization of our neighborhood watch program is proceeding successfully. We now have more than 70 block captains participating in an information network which d advises of law enforcement activity or incidents in the city. Block captains then share information with their neighbors, <coughs> asking nearby residents to directly notify the Orange County Sheriff's Department of any suspicious activity observed or in any area of recent activity. All residents are urged to be alert to questionable situations, persons or vehicles, and to contact OCSD directly at the 714-647-7000 number to request investigation by law enforcement officials. Those who have private security systems are asked to check their systems and immediately notify the Sheriff's Department of anything that seems out of line on their cameras. To increase safety and security in our community, there will be a home safety technology fair here at City Hall on January 7th at 7 o'clock p.m. And all residents will be invited to attend with the understanding there is no obligation. Uh, there will be representatives of various security systems here to demonstrate and explain the systems and the equipment available to increase home security, such as interior and exterior camera systems, computer monitors, alarm systems, and so forth. The wide array of options is confusing to people, and this event is designed simply to clarify what is involved with those various solutions. Home systems can be installed and operated independently of city or law enforcement registration, assuring privacy while generating information that can be volunteered by the homeowners to law enforcement officials when appropriate. 
Questions about the fair can be directed to Jared here at City Hall or to Wayne and myself. We are asking any residents who have not done so who are willing to serve as block captains to step forward and contact us. What will happen then is they will be added to the email communication link which instantly transmits alerts about crime activity or situations via email to the block captains. And Jared and, and council members have been good about notifying us so that we can get that information and follow up prompt, out promptly. There is no specific organization needed for a neighborhood watch, and there is no specific format. We're emphasizing to the residents that the involvement can be as minimal <coughs> or comprehensive as the neighbors and its residents choose to, to elect. As the sheriff just pointed out to us, the Orange County Sheriff's Department statistics indicate that the level of crime in the city is actually less in 2014 than in 2013. But the network of Neighborhood Watch is creating an increased level of awareness, which is of great benefit to our law enforcement. The release by the state of California of a large number of nonviolent criminals from prisons and jails has increased the potential for crime. The evolution to regional rather than neighborhood schools and increased traffic through our city from development to the east has made our hidden jewel a little less hidden. Residents are asked to be alert at all times and to assist the Orange County Sheriff's Department deputies by promptly reporting any activity of concern. We are asking them to call sooner rather than <coughs> later to be safe rather than sorry. We also urge them and remind them that residents are never to take confrontation into their own hands. Our deputies do that very safely and expertly and we ask that all residents rely on them. Another effort we are making is to make the citizens aware that they can check the sheriff's plotter online at any time they detect helicopter activity or see uh, law enforcement cars or activity in their neighborhoods and keep updated. We're also ad advising them that they can check the Megan's Law website to be aware of any potential threats that have been released into our community or their neighborhoods. We're very pleased with the success and the response of the community and I think we're back to having a very effective neighborhood watch program again in Villa Park. Do you have any questions? I have a, a comment. You indicated that the residents should call Jared at City Hall regarding this uh, electronic security seminar. It was my understanding at the last council meeting that we made sure that the city is not involved in any of the selling of any private security equipment or endorsing because the neighborhood watch program is separate from the city it's actually a voluntary program yes. so i'm not understanding why they would be calling what what is your role in this particular area uh, that's a great question we're just providing the space um they'll use this council chambers here and I believe Mr. Silzel is reaching out to a number of security companies and consultants to come on down and basically have a uh, fair and just let them advertise their services that they offer. Right. So if they're contacting you, which is I think is what you just said, that they're yes, going to contact you, the only thing you can say is where it's going to be and what time it is. Yes. Because I want to make sure that we don't endorse any particular item um, no. of security. So. And that's, of course, Neighborhood Watch is concerned, too, that the agents and representatives understand that this is just purely an informational session for our residents. There is no obligation on anyone's part. Uh, there's no preferential uh, status <coughs> for anyone who may be representing safety <coughs> and security equipment. Mary, I have a question. When is this? Was it January 7 January at 7 p.m. here? January 7 at 7 o'clock p.m. here in City January Hall. January 7? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Any other if questions? I may, Mr. Mayor, um, I am in agreement with uh, Deanna Fascinelli about, um, you know, the city not advocating for any one particular provider over another. I would like to see us, though, put out on the e-network, you know, a notice about this because I do think it's important for people to have an opportunity to have them all together and do a nice comparison. I, I would like to really thank Mary and Wayne Silzel for what they have done with revitalizing our Neighborhood Watch program because it had atrophied over the years. Uh, because too much too much city involvement because this is all about the citizens watching out 
for each other, watching out for themselves, and taking individual responsibility. And we do need to have, though, a good citizen leader to do that, and you and Wayne have done an amazing job. I was extremely disappointed last month when there was a statement made from this uh, dais basically disparaging the Neighborhood Watch program. I feel as a council and as leaders that we should actually be encouraging people to get involved with this Neighborhood Watch program, um, um, especially at this time of the year. And I'd like to make one suggestion, and it really came to my mind when Mr. Almer was talking about the dog walk. Uh, we have p dog walk. People are out walking their dogs at all times of the day or night. It might be a wonderful idea to have a neighborhood watch or sheriff's representation down at the dog walk when it occurs and educate those dog walkers on what they can do to keep an eye out. Really, it's the, it's the little things. Uh, we see it. There's a car parked there. We know it doesn't belong there. And but we let it go and drive on about our business, even though those little that little antenna went up when it's such a simple thing to just make a phone call, call the sheriff. And and the way I understand it, it it can be a positive interaction between the sheriff if it's somebody that really does belong there, no harm, no foul. But but we really do need to be on our toes, and we need to be aware, and we need to be watching out for one another, and we need leaders like you. So I wanted to thank you for that. Thank you. And then suggest that maybe you get with uh, Mr. Uh, well, get with the foundation and do a little um, cross pollinate pollinization, if we'll you will. <clears throat> but thank you so much for providing us with that report. You've really done a great job. Thank you. Thank and you. along that line, we have had a couple of times when residents have been walking with their dogs and have seen something, someone that doesn't belong or a vehicle that doesn't belong, and they just snapped a photo with their cell phone just to have it with them. And in one case, it uh, was called into the sheriff's department and was beneficial to them. So we're just asking people to just plain be good neighbors to each other uh, without making a big deal of it. Here, I do have one more question for you. Does the, you're now receiving the crime reports as we do, is that correct? No, we're we not. don't. We would like to, but we don't. Hmm. Um, I, I thought you were getting the announcements as the crimes occurred. No, No. Jared has relayed them to us, and Councilman Polly has relayed them to us. Okay. I mean, that's basically the way I get them is I get them relayed from, mm -hmm. from Jared. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the reason I asked is because, you know, I know that, that getting those reports constantly as they come out has a real impact on me because I see them and it's like, oh, my gosh, not again, not again, not again. Mm -hmm. And so... I'm really happy to see that 70 some odd, it, it was my perception that 70 some odd people are now getting them because I think that's going to have an effect. And I'm just wondering if it makes sense to put it out on the E network as they occur so even more people are aware of it because the more people are aware of what's going on in this community, the better off I think the community is going to be. So I don't know if we can do that, if it makes sense, but uh, it's something to think about. So, it's the more information we can get. All we're doing is just serving as a conduit receive the information and get it out to people. And then if we hear a follow-up, get the information out to them. So the more people can get information to us, the more helpful we can be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is the oral communication. This is where any of the members of the community can uh, appear and be heard on a matter that's not already on the agenda. And to do that, you approach the podium and give us your name and address, tell us what you want to talk about and we'll allocate five minutes. However, uh, however, before we start that, I think maybe I have a way to, to uh, kind of streamline this meeting and maybe uh, avoid some inconvenience and delay for people. You know, for those that don't mind, how many, if I could have a show of hands, how many people are here out of concern with potential uh, rehabilitation facilities in the city? I kind of figured that. Okay. With that in mind, and I'm gonna, you're all free to come up and you know speak at least as long as we don't just end up with a huge mass of you know duplications that take up the whole evening. Um, you're free to come up and speak. However, before you do that, I would like to ask our city <coughs> council, <coughs> excuse me, to address that so that you have some idea where we stand on this and what our options are. I can tell you that I don't think this has been researched at this point as much as we'd like to to have it, but. We do have some idea what's going on, and I'd like to have our council share that with you. And when she's done, then if you want to be heard on it, go ahead and uh, come on up, and we'll, we'll entertain that. But it may help some of you get home and, uh, and see where we're at. So with that uh, going, Megan, can you 
give us a little briefing on what's going on? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, a couple things. This just to before we start on that, this is not an agendized item, and so um, that means that under what's called the Brown Act, the City Council can't actually engage in an extensive debate over this issue or take any action on it tonight. Um, they're sort of able to receive their comments when matters aren't agendized um, and direct staff to take action, um, to research items or um, to ask further questions, but there's very, it's a very limited universe of the things that they can do tonight. Um, the second thing is that my understanding is that staff is sort of currently in taking a lot of information on the sober living facility that's, that's at issue, and so there isn't necessarily definitive answers on that particular issue because they're still sort of investigating. Um, with that said, uh, s the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal last year uh, recently found in a case involving the city of Newport Beach that a facially neutral ordinance, uh, so that means that it didn't distinguish between sober living facilities and other group homes. It, it tried to treat all group homes the same. Um, that that ordinance resulted in regulating sober living facilities and other group uh, living arrangements in a way that violated federal anti-discrimination and fair housing laws because <coughs> recovering alcoholics and drug addicts are considered disabled under federal law. What that, um, so in that case, the court found evidence suggesting that the primary purpose of the ordinance, even though it was facially neutral, was to discriminate against sober living facilities. What that effectively means for cities are that cities are prohibited from taking any actions that discriminate against or have a discriminatory impact upon sober living facility residents. Uh, the city of Newport Beach actually sought United States Supreme Court review on that case and a couple of weeks ago the Supreme Court denied that request, which means that the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal decision is, is the state of the law as it stands today. Um, what that means for what the city should, should sort of avoid doing in trying to regulate sober living facilities is distinguishing between sober living facilities and other group homes. So for example, um, prohibiting a sober living facility in a residential zone where other group homes are allowed would, have, would likely have a discriminatory impact. Um, requiring a conditional use permit when other group homes don't, aren't required to have conditional use permits would be the same issue. It would likely have a discriminatory impact. Uh, some cities have tried sort of distance requirements, requiring that sober living facilities have to be at least so many feet away from another sober living facility. If, uh, if that is not also applied to other group homes, they would have the same concern. Uh, what the city can do is enforce its residential zoning requirements equally against all residences. So if a sober living facility is not code compliant, the city can use the full force of its municipal code and police power and all of the remedies that are permitted under the municipal code to enforce that against a so that sober living facility if it's not compliant with the currently existing code. Um, one other sort of no, and this is where the law can start to become very technical. For sober living facilities, there are community care facilities and there are drug and alcohol recovery and treatment facilities. The latter two are govern statutorily created creatures. They're governed by state law and they have slightly different um, regulations than sober living facilities. The technical differences um, can probably be boiled down to sober living facilities don't provide medical treatment on site, whereas a drug and recovery treatment facility may provide, for example, detox. So those are the s distinctions. Um, sober living facilities as a result, because they don't provide those on site treatments, don't have state licensing requirements, whereas drug and alcohol treatment facilities do have state licensing requirements. Um, so that's sort of a brief summary of where we stand today. And again, we don't have all the facts about the, the sober living facility that may be at issue, um, but that's sort of the general. Megan, I don't know if you can address this or not, but you know, uh, just so that not only have they been briefed on the legal issues, but obviously I suspect most of them are 
concerned about specifically what are we dealing with now that some probably heard rumors it, would it be appropriate to provide a very very brief synopsis of what we understand is occurring now so that they have some idea of what what we're dealing with Jared knows more facts about that so he if may that's appropriate to... I suspect they'd probably like to hear what, what we're dealing with right at the moment in addition to whatever we may try and do in the future to sure regulate. with regard to the sober living facility in question <coughs> I spoke with the executive director this afternoon haven't confirmed any of the facts but spoke with her uh, I was told I'm reading my uh, my notes here that that the residents are not there during the day they have a self-imposed curfew of 10 p.m. Uh, no training or treatment is conducted on site. The homeowner actually homes, owns uh, several homes in the community, it was mentioned, as well as other several community care facilities where treatment occurs. Uh, the reason we see no cars on the property is because, again, I am told uh, cars are not allowed to be had by the, the residents and that they provide transportation. Told it's a woman's only facility. Uh, I'm told it's a non-smoking facility, um, which may help to calm some nerves and other associated impacts. Uh, I'm told there are four residents there at the moment. Um, they have the capability to uh, expand up to six, and if there's a seventh on site, it's because there's an on-site manager. Well, there's an on-site manager 24/7 uh, at the property. Um, most of the women are professionals. Um, it's not an insurance court regulated sober living facility it's more go on your own graces uh, it's it's pretty costly from what I'm told um, so we see a lot of professionals uh, doctors lawyers professors etc those who want to remain private um, and and it's my understanding that's why they chose Villa Park uh, because it is you know a, a secluded neighborhood, essentially. Um, each person stays for one month, um, no longer, and then they're transitioned elsewhere. Um, again, I'd just like to stress that this is what I'm told. I haven't verified it at the moment. Um, I'm looking at all sources and resources possible, and, and as soon as I get some facts and some information, you know, I definitely want to educate the residents in, in the neighborhood. Um, just to try to ease everybody's worries and fears about it. Meg, Thank you. Can, can I ask a question mm -hmm. of you? Can we regulate not having any group homes in the city so therefore we don't discriminate between a nursing facility versus a sobriety facility? Uh, it's an extreme, I understand, but is that possible? The, um, the law on community care facilities and uh, drug and rehab facilities is that under the law they are treated as a single housekeeping unit. So they're not even treated as a quote unquote group home. Um, that was the effectively the problem in the Newport Beach case was that they tried to make the definition of single housekeeping unit such that it would exclude certain group homes, specifically sober living homes, but not exclude single family residences. And so <laughs> as a practical matter, it's, it's a tricky proposition um, because of both the state law element and because as like in the Newport Beach, Beach case, it was a facially neutral law that intended to effectively eliminate group homes, um, but had the consequence of, intended consequence of eliminating Megan, so you're going to have to facilities. speak up a little bit. Anyway. Sorry. The, the, the consequence of the facially neutral law was to eliminate sober living facilities, even though on its face it didn't intend to do that. And um, at the end of the day, the court saw that as discriminatory intent to the sober living facility residents. So it's, it's a tricky thing to, across the board, eliminate it because of the state law requirements on community care facilities and treatment facilities and because of this sort of issue of uh, single housekeeping unit. How about from the side of having to get a business permit, looking at it at a different angle, that we would prohibit that would counseling or, or um, any sort of a room and board? 
because they do have a business permit here. Right. And I mean, they did it right. They didn't, w there's a lot of people who don't have business permits. Right. If they didn't do that, we wouldn't even know their name today. Um, That's something we can look at. Um, my initial instinct, though, is that it would be treating a community, a sober living facility, differently than other facilities if we require them to get a different kind of permit than just a business license, which everyone's required to get that operates a business. And so that may run afoul of the uh, issues of, dis of discrimination and discriminatory treatment. But we can look into that because that's something we haven't. We can look into right that. Right now that hasn't anywhere been used by any city at, at, this, we, at this point that we know Yeah, of. we've been looking at it okay. really from a land use perspective. So we can look at it from a, re a business regulatory perspective um, and see if that, that's a possibility. Megan, I had brought that up with you earlier before the meeting. But yeah. I, additionally, I wanted to find out about, because of Villa Park, the nature of Villa Park, 2.1 square miles, four schools, are there any rules, and I know you might not have had a chance to look it up, but that would prohibit them to, from being within a certain parameter of school facilities? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I am not aware of any rule that would have a distance requirement from schools. Um, again, if our code were, were to regulate that, it would have to regulate all homes in the same way. So that may be where we would run into some issues, but also something that we should we should research to get a certain answer on it. <clears throat> I think so. Well then can we direct we can direct staff to verify the information that was provided. Um, certainly someone who tells us that they have multiple homes in the in the city is a concern to us to make sure that we don't have multiple homes popping up with these types of um, units. They're certainly making quite a bit of money on it because that home was sold for a million five. Yeah. yeah. So um, I would like to direct right. staff to make sure you verify everything that's been provided to us yeah. and uh, have a follow up with us on the legal side of it, please. Definitely. Okay. So, this point of information how many other types of similar homes are there in town that you are aware of this, at this time? This is the only sober living facility that I'm aware of. Uh, I was on the community care licensing division. Uh, when we first found out about this. Naturally, that's where I, I go to find care facilities. There were eight um, assisted living for the elderly cares and then one adult uh, facility similar for um, 18 to 59 year olds. So nine in the community that at least are licensed through the state. But facilities of this nature, it's silly. It's, it's crazy, in fact, where they, they're not licensed by anyone essentially the state is pretty clear in all the the research that I've done at least that local governments are to treat these homes identically to a single-family home if I may um, hmm. I think this is my last council meeting so I won't be here as you weed your way through this we've dealt with this issue somewhat before um, never never a sober living facility but you know when I first got on the council, we only had five group homes, if you will, Mo and most of them were, you know, senior care, you know, facilities, which is a very different animal than something that's providing rehabilitation. We've gone from five to eight, now a ninth one, right, um, in really a pretty short period of time, and that's a concern. One thing I would suggest to the council is to pursue working with ACCOC and these other cities who are experiencing similar concerns uh, to tackle this particular issue. I think that um, since most of what you're talking about has to do with state legislation, that perhaps they need to work together to come up with some recommended legislative fixes that would provide leaf relief for family-based communities like our own. One of those might have to do with distance to school, uh, with, with a, within a school uh, zone. So. Uh, those are things I think that this council needs to pursue. I think it's gotten, Villa Park has become more attractive for these sorts of facilities because of the size of our lots, the size of their homes, the fact that they can make good money. And I think we need to, we need to really get aggressive with how we deal with it. Well, the next thing you know, it's going to be 16 such facilities in our community. We might want to put a call in to the listing and the selling agent also. They have a tremendous amount of information. One of them is familiar with uh, the city of Villa Park, so I think 
so they'll be cooperative. Is that it? Okay. Well, perhaps in your next position, Councilwoman Polly, you can, at a state level, you can fix this issue. Lovely. That said, um, I guess we can start the parade up here. Anyone would like to be heard on this issue, come on up and give us your name and address and, and uh, speak away, assuming that didn't answer all the questions. Hi, my name is Mort Israel. Uh, live on Patrician Drive, been a resident of Villa Park for 27 years. And uh, I'm glad to, to see the council taking this seriously because I'll tell you one thing for sure. If this particular facility is allowed to stay, her four other houses will be similarly used and, and uh, for the same purpose. Like you had mentioned, this is a very lucrative enterprise. And if we just sit back and say, well, gee, there's nothing we can do in state law, this, that, and the other thing. I mean, I know that we can't discriminate against sober, these sober housing or sober homes, whatever you want to call them, or multi or group homes. But maybe there can. There's got to be some way to deal with this that doesn't proliferate. Our hidden jewel is not going to be a hidden jewel anymore. It's going to be a tarnished bauble worth nothing. So you can put up these wonderful things at the beginning, you know, the entrance to Villa Park to increase house values, but when you allow these things to proliferate, house values are going to drop. And that's, you know, I don't think anybody wants to see that happen. So it's great. Maybe Patrician Drive is sort of the, I don't know, the east end of uh, Villa Park, the south end, whatever. We're not high up on the hill. But I want everybody here, you know, to pay attention to the fact that if this was occurring across your street, you would not be happy. And the fact that we have large homes that have sold for 1.4 or 1.5 million is really of little consolation. <coughs> so we need to be aggressive. I know I was referred to the article in the Orange County Register, the Costa Mesa is dealing with this. But to sit and be timid in the face of what's happening, you should see this woman's home, the executive director. She lives in Newport Beat in a 10, 12,000 square foot home. She's not worried about somebody putting one of these facilities across her street. Maybe that's what we should do. Maybe the city of Villa Park should buy the home next door to her and put in the same facility. You know something? Instead of litigation, it would be a lot cheaper, and we might be able to get our point across. Thank you. I'm Neil Harness. Uh, I'm next door neighbors to Mort, and I, I also applaud the council for taking this seriously. Uh, I have six kids, um, ranging from five, or, well, I guess five to fifteen, and my biggest concern is their safety. Um, I, I personally would have not have a problem living across the street from a sober living house on my own, but I really am concerned about the children. There's other children that are on our block. I think there's nine or ten children within about a hundred yards of that sober living facility. So I have great concerns about their safety. And I, I would like to know, and you won't know now, but uh, if you could tell me or find out who is liable when something happens to somebody on our street, if something happens or something, something's vandalized or there's a, there's a problem that occurs, who is liable? Is it the owner of that sober living facility? Is it the city of Villa Park? Who is liable? And that, so that's my main, major question and concern. Maybe that could be answered next time we, we meet. Uh, and being a physician, I work with people with disabilities like this all the time. And I can tell you that somebody who's an alcoholic or somebody who's a drug addict, they're always an alcoholic, they're always a drug addict. Even if they've gone through treatment, they still have susceptibility to you know, relapse. And that's a, that could occur at any time, anywhere. And they have friends that come over. That I know that there's visiting hours and, and this sort of thing till 10 o'clock, but that all, you know, is, again, if it's not regulated by the state and it's not, they're not, they're not holding a license, I don't know what recourse we, we have uh, when something goes wrong. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Good evening. My, uh, my name is Mark McCracken, and I'm actually a, a resident of the city of Irvine, but I'm here on behalf of my um, sister and her uh, husband, who are residents of Villa Park. Um, it's been about a little over two weeks ago. Um, my um, uh, sister was um, hit by a, a car um, crossing the um, crosswalk um, right over by Villa Park Elementary after her uh, taking her kids to uh, school. And um, uh, 
she's recovering. She's getting better. She's actually home now and, and resting. But um, my concern um, in, in talking to my sister and her husband is um, the lack of a, uh, I guess at one time there's been a crossing guard there at one time or another. And apparently there has not been one there for quite some, for a while at least. And um, my sister's told me about several near misses of people turning, making right turns off of Villa Park Road onto, I think it's Center Street there. Um, and, um, you know, the concern is, you know, and I'm sure it has to do with probably working with the school district as well, is, you know, what do we need to do to, to get a crossing guard back there again? And whether a crossing guard would have prevented this, um, you know, who's to say? But um, it's the, the kids there that um, uh, I think deserve to have, you know, as much protection as they can get because obviously Villa Park Road is a very busy street and, and um, you know, people are, are trying to get their kids to school and, and probably aren't sometimes not paying attention to what's going on. So um, I just wanted to uh, come and say that on her behalf. So um, um, I hope that they can, you know, either the city or, or the district find the funds to put somebody over there again and, and uh, make it a little bit safer for the kids. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening. I'm Kathleen Moran. I live at 10162 Workman Circle. I'm speaking today as a resident of Villa Park, but I bring with me um, my job position right now. I have worked for Supervisor Morlock. I'm one of his policy advisors for the last eight years. Um, I brief him on health care agency and social service. So I have at my disposal over the late eight years much more than information that these people have on it just because of the health care agency that I, that I deal with. And I think before all decisions are made, there does have to be a lot of research because I just became aware of this uh, this weekend. Um, I've gone into my records and there's all sorts of different things that are different on sober housing. There is, there are licensed ones which are by community care. There are also certified ones that are done by the sheriff. And there's also ones that have no type of oversee. You need to know what type of, of program this is, if it's being set up to come in and get the mental health dollars to run a program there. Um, there's many, many things that you need to look into this to decide whether it's just a living place or it's a program because it makes a big difference and it may legally have a lot of difference for you on it, the, the part of it being run as a business. Um, there is a study out now that the health care agency did on um, the study on recovery for these programs, it's very um, eye-opening on the recidiv recidivism rate and what type of element you are bringing into your city. I am disappointed as a resident because I sat here two months ago and I am one of the um, captains for Neighborhood Watch. This is the kind of stuff we're supposed to know about. And through the research I've already done on this is my understanding that this residence was, it has an OCFA permit for sprinklers instead of going through the normal city part. These, when you go to these different levels of group homes, whether it's a licensing or whether it's certified by the sheriff or whether it's nothing, an element of whether or not you have to bring sprinklers into a house is an important piece. So you have a lot of research that needs to be done here, but as a resident and especially as a neighborhood watch captain, to find this out the way I did, I don't get it. I mean, we're, we're t being told that if you see 
cars that you don't recognize. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to know what's going on in our neighborhood. And this has been kept very, very quiet and very under, underneath. So I'm willing to see what it is. I understand the sober living facilities. I don't want to see Villa Park become what has happened with the executive director of the uh, Recovery Bay Rehabilitation, who is listed as the owner on this, is Izzy Henson. She's the executive director also, and she also is listed as the owner. And what you have in a lot of group home situations, you will have people come in and buy up a home, put in a program that basically pays their mortgage, and 20 years later, they walk off with the house. It happened down at, at Sober Living at the Sea, if you remember that from 10 years ago. That's what you may be seeing here in Villa Park. And you need to look at the different vehicles if this is what you want to, you know, give to your residents and if this is what's going. I would just, I think it's too early to know exactly what's going on. I haven't been able to um, pull up all my files on this, but these are definitely things that I think you need to look into. And um, to be very honest, I think to defer to your remarks, I think because there is some, there is definitely some business parts of this, but I think you need to look into business licensing because there's a difference on all of this too because there can be a situation in which a person can buy a home and have six different individuals live there and there's not a lot you can do either so there's there's a lot that i think you need to get your legal people in to understand what's going on and um, i will be more than happy to share the stuff with you i'm just a little bit further ahead of it than you are and and, and i will be glad to do that Thank you. In a few minutes. Thank you. Catherine, you, you might want to share your contact information with city staff as well. Thank you. Hello, Terry Elmendorf, 10291 Camden Circle. I just have uh, two questions. Are we permitted to know if any of these residences have a criminal record and how serious a crime they may have committed to get drugs or yeah, it's, it just would be something that I would feel more comfortable knowing. And uh, the other question is, if we have a halfway house in our neighborhood and we're selling our home, do we need to disclose this information to uh, prospective buyers? That would certainly affect our ability to sell our homes. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Anyone else? Yeah, hi guys. My name's Jack Evans. I live across the street from this new lovely house. Um, and I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but <clears throat> most of the stuff Jared said is absolutely not true. I live across the street from this house. Nobody lives there. We talked to the contractors today. Nobody has moved in there yet. In fact, <clears throat> their landscapers mow the lawn. They leave their trash cans out there. I put them in their backyard every week. They're absolutely full of crap. When Ed passed away, um, his daughters and his wife had some issues, so I went over there and helped them out. And we were told that a Asian lady bought it for her daughter who lived in Huntington Beach, or excuse me, Laguna Beach, and that she was moving in. Nobody's been in this house since the day they sold this house. I want to say three or four months ago. Not one person has been there. I live across the street. So hmm. the notion that Izzy tells you, Jared, that people have been there for two months and there's four people living there, it's a bunch of crap. Nobody lives there. There's no lights on. There's nobody there. I live across the street. I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. There's no cars coming in or out. In fact, there was contractors there today, and we went and talked to them, and they said, no, we're not done. In fact, hmm. the only reason you guys found out is because Morty came over to my house Sunday night and said, I think it was Sunday, and said, hey, did you know he went over there and talked to this fire sprinkler guys? And they said, oh, no, this is an assisted living home. 
And I've come to find out it's a sober living home. I mean, I cannot believe you guys gave these people a license in our residence to allow that kind of crap when there's a bunch of kids on the street. It's just, I, it's unbelievable. And I understand there's a bunch of laws and whatnot to protect the Disability Act, but I think it's just a bunch of crap. I cannot believe we're going to allow this to happen in our city. Hmm. Thank you. Any uh, any other speakers? Can, can I? I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I want to talk about the business license thing a little bit, if I can. Uh, I brought this up many months ago when I was trying to make my play for getting rid of the business um, license admin fee, in that nothing happens in order for the city to check anything out other than somebody fills out their name and gives them a check. No background check, nothing happens. They could be anything. They could write anything they want to down on those applications, and they're automatically issued a business license. I think most residents assume that when a business license has been issued, a little bit more has gone into it than somebody just filling out an application and handing over a check. That's not the case. But we did issue a business license, correct? <clears throat> when? My question, it, yeah, well, my question is, can it be pulled? And how? That's 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 a legal question. That's a legal question. You don't have to answer it right this minute. You need to answer it soon. Megan, is this a discussion we can have? I mean, I'm happy to. I'm just asking the question. I'm I, not. I'm just uh, planting questions for you to consider. That's I, all. I understand what you're doing. I just want to know what we can do because trust me, I'm no more. I'm not any happier about this than anyone else. I just want to know what our latitude is, and we'll do this in an appropriate way. Can we have this discussion on this now? This, the, uh, this is not an agendized item, and so you're very limited in what you can do. You can effectively direct staff to research matters or look into things further, but it's, it's beyond the scope to get into a debate amongst council as to what to do Correct. with this. I, I suspect that, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's much question, but what we would like to have it thoroughly investigated, know exactly what our options uh, are. That, right. that, that, was, that was abundantly clear today before the meeting even occurred, so. All I, I think, I think today that we should uh, take, 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 take Can you come to the podium? Yeah, yes, yeah. please come to the podium. If you'd like to speak, yeah, come on up. Thank you. Just simply giving them things to research, that's all. Find out how to make it happen. I'm Susie Goldman. I live down the street from this lovely new whatever that's going into our neighborhood. That's, and I'd like to know when the license was issued for this place. The license was issued July 21st, 2014. In what name? Please? Recovery Bay with uh, Izzy Herson. She does not tell the truth. She, When she bought the house from the Loritzes, she said that it was for her daughter, and there are not people living in it. This is a nightmare for our street. Something must be done about it. It's. Well, I, I think council's pretty much aware and concerned over the situation. We can't really get involved as a council at this meeting because we haven't agendized it and it's illegal. However, you can rest assured that staff is going to be looking into this and that they were doing that before this meeting ever occurred. Uh, the, the, the concerns arose well, well prior to this <coughs> meeting. Go ahead. I'm doing the same thing. Um, Kathy Lai, live on Wildwood Way. Um, my understanding is that she owns four other properties in Villa Park. Have she, have any of those properties been permitted for these sprinklers or uh, a business permit being pulled on her other properties? I don't have that information handy. Yeah, I, I but I just think, and, and how do you get things put on the agenda for next month? Is this will well, this, th this will be put on it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing it would, but <laughs> all right. Thank you. 
any council member can put them on so you can talk to any of the council members but i'm sure this will be on hi my name is holly von ting i live at uh, 10241 camden circle my question at this point would be by the time it's agendized next month i would be afraid that that facility would be filled by then by waiting another another month to to talk about this so my question would be with 20 plus kids that live within a stone's throw of this of this facility what are our options at this point and can you i, I don't think we can respond to that I, I think council frankly has already addressed the issue we don't have the facts we're researching the law and we don't know where we are so so first of all we can't really get involved because it's not agendized but even if we did we really don't have the information in terms of the facts or the law so there's not much we can talk about. It, it, it's kind of like per beating the proverbial dead horse, and we just don't know. Okay, but it sounds like we're looking at that. It. it isn't. It isn't filled. So maybe we're a little bit ahead of the eight ball here. I think, if, if I may, I, I really feel like her question is a valid question. Um, you know, there's no rule that says you have to wait until the next meeting. At what would it take for there be to? They think time is of the essence, and perhaps that's true. What would it take for there to be an urgency meeting of the council set, and what would the potential action be? Uh, the um, council can hold special meetings at its discretion, uh, so that's a possibility. Any action taken relating to this property, um, to the extent it requires council action, obviously requires a meeting. It's unclear without all the facts what the action would be though um i mean if it's not operating it's different than if it is operating it's different than if it's code compliant or not code compliant there's just a universe of things that we don't know right now so i'm sorry but i don't have a great answer as to what action to take without knowing more so how, what are, we are can you going to be doing the research on this megan yourself yes sir okay so what okay. we can say though is if we're going to get the information the city manager is going to get the information and it'll be conveyed to us if we get enough information that we know who they are what property they own in villa park what type of facility they are this council will hold a, 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 spe a special council yeah. meeting i mean and, and we will do that um, it's great that you know I'm emailing you and, and trying to keep you up to date. But if we get enough information, we will hold the meeting. What do we need? Three days notice? Twenty four hours. Twenty four hours back. notice, and we'll do that. And we'll notify everyone. We don't need to wait thirty days, but we have to have some information to hold the meeting. So yeah, with that, and, and with that in mind, I think Kathy Moran offered oh, yeah. a. She's done a, a tremendous amount of research already yeah. in her current position. So I think Kathy's fitted to be a resource. And I don't have any problem doing that. And I don't no, think anyone else not. here has that either. I think that I think that it's urgent enough that that I would say that that would be the direction yeah. of this council that we not wait and take a couple of days to get into it immediately. Dig into it right away tomorrow morning. Yeah. Okay. The cleaning crew cleaned their house up yesterday. Yeah. The, you know, the the process is well underway. We we already had a tentative uh, schedule to have a, a summary uh, sheet out this week with the various um, uh, programs and requirements and, and what, what we might be able to do. But council's looking at it, and frankly, you know, they're going to have to do what they're going to have to do to get us the information, and when that's available, if, it, if it's appropriate, and we can do anything with a special council meeting, I can assure you. I mean, I know this council pretty well. There will be no problem setting a special meeting. We just got to get the information and ascertain what our options are. There's no point to come back and sit here shaking our heads again. It's just pointless. It's just a waste of your time, our time. Let's let them get the information. Let's let them do the legal research. Let's get let's get a brief. Let's get some options. We'll know what we can do, and then we can sit down and have a, you know, an intelligent meeting and some more public comment. But until then, it's pointless. As soon as that shows up, you know, I'm happy to to, to call a meeting anytime. So, and I think the whole council's on board with that. They're probably all shaking their head. Oh yeah. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So it's a pretty small community here. You won't, you won't find problems with that. We just need to know where we're at and what our options are. It's going to take a little time to figure it out. Hopefully not very much time. And as soon as we get it, we'll act. Hi, I'm Katie Peterson. Um, I live in um, City of Orange, not in Villa Park. And I just wanted to in talk about the, it not including the law, but the people who are staying at the um, sober facilities. I've witnessed it firsthand. Um, and there could be people in Villa Park also that 
are alcoholics or addicted to drugs that want the help in the city they live in that they feel safe in. And I understand the concern about where the homes are located, um, but witnessing it myself with family, you, you would want your city to be recognized as a place that accepts um, people that are sober, that have problems, because not everybody's perfect, but in that Villa Park supplies the needs of their, of their citizens here and others who would like to be a part of a place like this, who need help, who want to fix themselves. Thank, thank, thank you. you. I mean, frankly, there, there's, there's a point there as well. You know, it isn't just this issue. We've got other issues with regard to activities or structures or whatever it may be that, that we maybe don't find real desirable. And, and one of the problems is that some of the stuff's needed and, you know, nobody wants it if they can avoid it. So that, that's the other side of the coin. But that said, uh, we will move as rapidly as we can on this. And as soon as we have anything that's sufficient to act on, we'll be happy to call another meeting. very nice what she had to say about uh, helping these people out which I think most of us would agree to but this is being run as a commercial enterprise for profit it is very profitable if she was doing this altruistically and saying I, I bought this house and I'm gonna have them come here to rehab so they can get back in society we'd probably all agree what a wonderful thing it is but she's not doing it for those reasons she's doing it because there's money to be had and that's an altogether different, what should I say, bottle of wax. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. So hearing none, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Thank everyone for taking the time to come down here and no. have the interest to discuss it and present it. All right, item one is a uh, public hearing with regard to a variance permit. Uh, Jennifer, who, I don't know who's presenting that. Jennifer, are you going to present that? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sorry about that. Uh, Jennifer will present the report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. The item before you is consideration of a variance, a request to reinstate an old variance approval that was provided back in 2001. This would be a little bit different than the application that was approved at that time, part of which is because our code has changed. And so all of the requests that went through before aren't uh, necessary now, thanks to some of our code revisions. Um, however, the applicant does still have encroachment into the side and the front yard setbacks. The way that our code is written, we actually have a provision that allows our city manager the review and approval of some small encroachments into the side yard setback. However, because this application also included a front yard setback encroachment, we felt it was better to bundle it together and bring it to the council for approval. Um, so that's why you're seeing that request, uh, although it does meet the administrative relief portion of our code. So essentially what you have before you is a request to add onto a home. They'll be adding a basement, a garage, and then a second dwelling unit above the garage. Um, all of the um, facility meets all of the other development standard requirements, so there's no other changes to site coverage, FAR, or anything else. But our code has a funny little provision. We're still working on those cleanup items, as you recall. Uh, we have a funny provision that says you can have a staircase that encroaches into the front yard setback. But once we enclose the staircase, you can't encroach into the front yard setback. So essentially, the request tonight to encroach into the front yard setback is for that staircase. Um, but because the applicant has chosen to put it behind a nice wall and try to fit it into the house uh, elevation so that it's not as visible from the street, it requires a variance permit. Um, so with that, uh, staff is recommending approval of both the encroachment into the side yard setback because it is a minor encroachment and the front yard setback meeting the findings that it really maintains the character of the neighborhood. It is not a special uh, granting of a privilege because this is an unusual circumstance with that staircase, as well as the lot configuration, which we've identified in your staff report. We're happy to answer any questions that you might have. 
and the applicant is here this evening if you have any questions for them as well. Jennifer, were there, were there any objections? We have received no calls, no objections. Mm. And I'm sorry, this did go to CDC, and CDC is also recommending approval of this as well. Okay. Council, have any questions of staff? Looks like a nice okay. project. Yeah. yeah. Okay, any uh, community response or comments? Uh, Mr. Baker. Just the encroaching applicant. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Baker, 18301 Hillcrest on the corner of center. Uh, I'd like to, Mr. Mayor, council members, staff, I'd like to thank the staff for their uh, recommendations. I'll submit on the tentative. I'll uh, go with the uh, staff report. If you have any questions of me, I'll be happy to answer them. But I will tell you that before the last council meeting when it was originally set, I did approach my neighbors with a written letter with a map and a photograph of, from Google Maps of what it would sort of look like from the street, from above, and I received back from my neighbors consents. The, uh, I passed out a little over 20, I think it was 21 or 22 letters, and I got back 12 consents from neighbors who are directly affected by it. They either live across the street or next to me or down the street, and they'd be driving past this every day. Uh, we have tried to do it, I have my, my designer here, we have tried to do it in a very architecturally nice way, in keeping with the house that's there, but more importantly to get my uh, cars off the driveway and in the garage. Any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. I have one. The individuals that signed those documents, did they attend a cocktail party with any time frame that your residents uh, did not signing? Not yet. <laughs> the grand opening, right? The grand opening, that's it. <laughs> No, no questions? No questions. Thank Great you very project. much for your time. Very nice. All right. Anybody want to uh, make Mr. a motion? Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry if I might. Oh, no, I actually have something else. Okay. Um, just one thing before Megan Jensen. Uh, we have a condition that we'd like to add to the resolution. It's actually already a condition of our code with, that deals with second dwelling units that requires a deed restriction um, be placed on the property. And so we would add that condition and essentially just enforces an item that's already on the books and in our code. What's the restriction? Um, it deals with property ownership and telling the next property owner that this is a second dwelling unit and that they have to abide by all the conditions that are in the code. Um, so the size of the structure and all of those things that are in place. So it's kind of a disclosure requirement, if you will. So would that be condition number three, a special condition three? Thank you, yes it would. Okay. okay. So someone wanna make a motion I'll to move. incorporate that? I'll Second. move that. Okay. Wait, uh, actually, Mr. our, our attorney, our attorney has something else. Um, Mr. Mayor, I may, we skipped on the agenda the waiver and reading of full of all ordinances and resolutions. Ooh, so I'm before sorry. we take I, a motion oh, on I, this, I'm sorry, take, I missed that. That's okay. Yep, you're right, I did. I missed it. Uh, yeah, so uh, I would propose that we, I guess I make a motion to waive the uh, reading in full of the ordinance and resolutions as they're already on the agenda. Second. Jared? Yeah, voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 I, I apologize for that. I missed it. I'll, I'll go ahead and make a motion to adopt resolution number 2014-3300, resolution of the City Council of the City of Villa Park, approving variance permit number 0761 with the addition of special condition number three deed restrictions as outlined by Jennifer Lilly. Second. Go ahead, Jared. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilman Pulley? Yes. Councilman Mills? Yes. Councilman Reese? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Passanelli? Yes. Mayor Barnett? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. So when you have that oh, cocktail party, party. yeah. <laughs> We're all yeah, coming. about the cocktail party. Ah. Okay. Moving on to item two. Well, this uh, item two regarding uh, the conditional use permit, uh, I think maybe Jared uh, on that one. Uh, at this time, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, we're acti asking that this item be continued until the next meeting. We have a couple of issues, one of which is the property owner signature on the application, and also the CDC has not had an opportunity to meet with the applicant um, in order to work through stealthing requirements and some of the other issues. But most importantly um, is with the structural integrity of the poll. Uh, the structural review has come back from our city engineer and has found that the um, intensification of the pole, if you will, has put it into the, to the area that's gray from an, 
an engineer's perspective that says it's not quite past the point of being structurally um, unsafe, but it's in that area that causes concern. And our structural engineer believes that there's some additional information that wasn't reviewed by the structural engineer of record, and they want that additional information in order to verify that it is, in fact, um, safe. So not having that information tonight ready to go, we'd like to ask that you continue the item until next month. Would someone like to make that motion? I'll always move it to next such. And I'd like to make the note that are they taking all the wind shear in account here? That's, that has been taken in, into account. However, our structural engineer believes that additional information is needed. Thank you. Jared? Yes, this is a motion to continue it to the uh, December 16th meeting. I'm all for that. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. All opposed? <laughs> Hearing none. Hearings continued. <laughs> all right. The next item is our consent calendar. So let me just ask uh, council members, does anyone want to pull any consent items? I'd like to pull number five. I think we almost had a clean, if you hadn't done that, I think we almost had a clean sweep. I've never seen that happen. Sorry. Okay. Uh, well, how about you want to... Make a motion on the rest of them? Yeah. I move to uh, approve three, four, six, and seven on the consent calendar. Second. Second. Jared? Greg Beasley. Oh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem Todd Miller. Yes. Councilman Mills? Yes. Councilman Reese? Yes. Councilman Haas? Yes. Mayor Burnett? Yes. Motion carries to approve the remainder on to number five. Um, I read these minutes, and they're, they're weak. Um, and I realized I had a, a meeting here with um, Jared, and I realized that the DVD is the final authority, but uh, I do believe that our written minutes are easier to read for our residents as well as the council when they're scanned in online. And we need a little more detail. There was a lot of discussion during the public hearing um, for items number one, for item number three, um, the entire council you know, didn't comment. Item number, you know, I'm looking at item number 13, and I'll give you an example. Lieutenant Gunzo explains the squad car mileage for the month of September. A, a little more detail should be noted that they, he also indicated that we have three other cars that are traveling, and it wasn't just one car um, that was traveling. So we don't need to go into too much detail, but specifically I'd like to make a mention on item 14 that the city council discussion ensued but there was no comment from Councilman Reese and myself. And if we could make note of that in that, that would be um, beneficial. And if we could put Alexia's uh, title, she was a school board member underneath that. It right. shows that she's a resident. And actually, Dr. Alexia Della Gianni. I think that's appropriate. She's actually the vice chair of Orange Unified School District. Thank you. That would be appropriate. Thank you. Um, and See on the next page, we have Sally Faber instead of Allie. So all I'm looking, maybe we just need to review it. And if you could want to send us another copy of it and we'll take a look at it, that'd be great. But a little more detail in our written minutes would be beneficial to our residents and I think to the council. With that. Right, do you want to move that one? So I would like to move it, move it with a, resi a revision coming to us for final approval. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I move that. Second. Okay. Thank you. Hmm. We get a second? Yeah, I second it. I thought so. Okay, go ahead, Jared. Uh, I, I received the direction, so we can move on to item number eight. Okay, okay I presume we have a presentation from Michelle on this one? We do. Uh, okay. Turning on the projector. Should be ready in a minute. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, and Jared. Um, Basically, what we have before us today, eventually we'll be able to see it, <laughs> is um, the payout of, of the per side fund. This has been the topic of the pensions are out of hand and what can we do as a city, what's feasibly financially stable. And as we are still waiting to get back from PERS the actual <laughs> potential <laughs> um, termination liability that we will have to pay off. Um, not quite sure when I spoke with Carrie, um, our contact at PERS this last week, he hadn't heard anything, so he had no numbers yet. Um, we don't know what the, the big picture payoff is, but we're trying to take off a piece of the, the pie, if you will. 
the PERS rate, um, as in the staff board has reported, that there's, there's a bunch of different percentages that make up our PERS employer's contribution. And the biggest thing that our city has that larger cities don't have is a side fund. And the side fund is because we have less than 100 employees, blah, blah, blah. We had a bit put into a risk pool, a um, lot of boring details. But so we have the side fund percentage that we have to pay every year. The potential to pay it off as of December 31st this year is, um, you'll see the lump sum prepayment amount is 253525 <coughs> Now, the, the true savings that we would have if we were to continue to pay it for the next um, seven years to um, 2021, the payments are 326000 So $72,000 would be the savings that we would have. We lose interest based on the money that you pay out. So, you know, net maybe 60000 that we would true savings because we're going to make a lot of interest, I'm feeling. <laughs> um, <laughs> so basically... It's, um, as the mayor and I were speaking a little bit earlier today, is, yeah, if you're going to save $60,000 over the next few years and you have the ability to pay it, sounds like a good deal. Um, some of the numbers that we wanted to point out to you is our um, unfunded liability right now is 939000 Now, that means that we have a funded ratio of what we have paid into our market value of our PERS is 74%. If we pay this lump sum payment off, it bumps up, but bumps us up about 4%. So our estimated unfunded liability is $686,000. Now, unfortunately, that's not what we'd have to pay off. <laughs> I know it kind of sounds like, oh, if we just pay that off, then we'll all be good. Yeah, no, there's all the actuarial calculations that go into that, and it's a million plus more. So even though that's a small number and it looks really great, um, it does bring down our funded portion, and that's obviously a good thing is what we're trying to do is be fully funded. Um, and the last slide is to show you what our current rate is, is 22.692, and that's the employer's rate. Now, again, the staff pays 6% um, of the 7%, which is the employer's por employee's portion. Next year, it'll be full 7%. So this is just the employer's rate as of today, no employee um, rate included. If we take off this um, side fund, our effective rate as of January 1 would be 11%. So it's, it's a big chunk. Um, and so the staff report before you states that, you know, the savings could be net into about $60,000 over the next um, seven years, six years. Um, we're waiting for your direction. If you have any questions, I'm here. Michelle. Yeah, yes, excuse, go ahead, Rick. Can we go back a slide? Because I think I may have actually understood something for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> um, Don't. <laughs> this unfunded lab, this is the gross unfunded liability, mm -hmm. right? Right. Okay. So can I assume, if you know or can understand what they're telling you, is that essentially the liability that if we want to terminate, that will probably turn into several million dollars because they will change the, they will change yes. the uh, the cap rate on it yes. from seven and a half to one percent or so for a T bill rate, yes. and that'll turn into several million dollars. Correct. Correct. Yes. So that's the deal. Correct. Okay. So all right. Now that I understand, I I can explain this now. If so. you have, I have our current um, actual report and our hypothetical termination liability is two point eight million as of June thirtieth, twenty thirteen. You know they have to calculate it up couple years so when I was talking with Carrie I'm like okay so now if we pay this off what does it do to that number and basically it increases our market value so it takes off that 253,000 of the 2.8 so it's, it's a true reduction of 253,000 on um, your hypothetical number <laughs> so I mean it is it is a quite a significant like straight line reduction so, so the 253 mm -hmm. would give us a dollar for dollar pay down mm -hmm. But the 686, yeah. we're stuck at the 1% figure. Okay. Yeah, that's going to be the whole reactionary little calculation that will, yeah. Okay. So let me share this because I've heard this so many different places, Dr. Sonny. Let me, let me share this with counsel. Just if I, if I cross the line or I'm incorrect, just, just wave, your, wave at me. But here's my understanding, and this goes for all kinds of sources. Um, CalPERS is using about a 7.5% earnings rate. Mm -hmm. 
So when they take their pool of money, all these funds we've paid in for retirement, they calculate, they calculate what their future actuarial costs are going to be to, to pay all these mm -hmm. retirement funds out, all these speculative numbers, basically, who's going to live how long, how much they're going to make 30 years from now, and how much are we going to need to pay them off. Obviously, ridiculous to, to think you could really do that, but they do it. Okay? They come up with a number. Then they look at the pool of money they have from our contributions and they say, okay, well, how much money do we need at 7.5% a year interest earnings on this fund in order to have enough money down the road to pay these corresponding pension claims? And that's where they come up with these numbers. That's where they come up with our percentage. That's essentially what, what this number is if, if we pay off this Actually, I guess it's probably the whole number, the whole 939. So they say that based on that calculation, Villa Park, you have a deficit of $939,557 uh, in present value funds. You'd have to write us a check, and then that would cover your deficit. Mm -hmm. The problem is this. If they would let us out of the fund, I suspect this council would probably vote to, to bail out and move on and pay the $939,000. If you elect to terminate your CalPERS participation, then instead of giving you credit for 7.5% on that money, since you no longer have any liability in the fund, they take it down to like a 1% T-bill rate so that all of a sudden when they discount it, when they, when they figure they're only going to earn 1% on the money instead of the 75 they normally calculate, yeah, it's going to take $3 million to pay it off. So if I understand this correctly, the 253 they'll let us pay off and they'll give us the complete credit as long as we stay in the plan. If we try and get rid of the rest of this, that's going to turn into a several million dollar number. Okay. okay? And so what they're doing is on this, if we don't pay that off in a lump sum, I assume that the numbers you gave us is what it's going to be over six years with a seven and a half percent interest rate on it. Correct. Okay. Okay. So either we keep the money and hedge our bet to see what happens to CalPERS because the Lord only knows what, what's going to what's going to happen there. Whether they're going to make it, whether you know the state's going to step in, the bottom falls out of the stock market and their funds worth very little. So if we want that security of sitting back with our money rather than paying it all out and then being there with an insolvent CalPERS down the road, we have to sit there and pay them their 7.5% interest. If we give them the money, then uh, one of two things will happen. They'll either earn more than we do, which I'm sure they'll do because their investments aren't as secure. Uh, they will either invest that and maybe get their 7.5% or they won't, and that will just continue to create a deficit at the fund, and then they'll just increase our ongoing current rate to compensate for the fact that they didn't get the 7.5% on the money of the 253000 that we did pay them. Is that a pretty good uh, That's deal? That's how I understand how it's going to roll out. So, so, so this is kind of a no-win. Um, and the trade-off seems to me is this. We either hold our money, pay the 7.5% to CalPERS on the interest, and see what happens to CalPERS, which is speculative. It's not going to get any better. You no. Know, or we pay them the seven and we pay them the two hundred and fifty-three. We get off the hook on the seven and a half percent for that money, yeah. at least directly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then Doesn't maybe we pay our share of an across-the-board increase they do to everybody because they didn't earn enough money on their fund. So. I have three questions. Kind of a no-win. I, I have three questions. Uh, I, I see we're gonna we're gonna be pull, first of all if we were to do this. Mm -hmm. We're pulling money out of Orange County Investment mm -hmm. Pool in LAFE. Mm -hmm. Is that actually then tapping into our undesignated reserves? No. No, okay. Oh, that was, okay, very good. What is an acceptable um, estimated funding ratio? We're sitting at 74% right now, give or take. 78%. I mean, I mean, that sounds pretty good compared to what? True. I, I see where you're going with this. Um, the, we... I spoke a lot with Tustin, the city of Tustin, who obviously Hi. did the same. I think their f rate, hold on one second, I believe, no, I don't have their rate. Um, I think in the 80s is what I, 
I have seen. Okay. So I, that would put us closer then to where we would really want to be comfortably is what you're saying. Yes. I, I mean, I think for me, the problem with PERS is that there's so many moving pieces. And when you call and you get your information, it changes the next day. And then it changes two more days after that. And you're talking about one thing with somebody and you're like, okay, I understand that it's supposed, there, there's a concept that shouldn't change. But the concept seems to be um, a big ball of wax that just, I mean, you know what I mean? I mean, it's right. for, I know I'm not really articulating this very well, but it, it's, a, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. <laughs> Sort of like a moving target in a fishbowl. It is. It is. It, and, it's, and it's frustrating because as much as I'm like, okay, I get it. I get, I get this piece of the puzzle. And then I go and I ask one more question. I'm like, now I don't get it. Now it this doesn't, make, doesn't make sense. You know, and, and how they explained it to me was that your, um, obviously your market value is going to change um, based on the investment value of the entire pool along with yours as well. Um, that's what... That's where our actual aerial number comes from, but it's two years prior. So then we got to pull in your current year stuff. So it's, I'm like, well, I have my current year stuff, and I know it only went up this percentage. Yeah, well, that, but then we have this, act, this part that we have to bring into and the, the longevity rate. So there's so many pieces. I'm not an actuary, and they speak a completely different language, but there's like 55 pieces that go into the calculation that make your head want to pop. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting that you bring it. Kathy Moran, who is here, she yes. is actually an actuary by trade. Oh, so you might want to talk to her. You might want to just hire her. No. Um, <laughs> she's going to be out of a job here, I understand, uh, in a little while. Uh, because I'm looking at this projected side fund payments. They go, they're ratcheting up year after year after year after yeah. year. We don't know how much. It could go up even more. It will. So it's, if, it's, if, if we're paying this off now and they've given us a letter right. with a date on it, um, that, that kind of locks at least that in. But there's one sentence in this letter that's from CalPERS that stands out to me, and I would like you to address that for me. Okay. It's the last sentence in the paragraph. They've told you if you pay everything off by X date, um, you're good to go. But any later adjustments due to plan amendments, vouchers, golden handshakes, or financing changes could increase or reestablish a negative side fund. See, they're the ones that established the side fund for us in the first place. They forced us into it in 2003, right? right. right? So what prevents them from deciding, ah, you got to go back into a side fund? Exactly. We had Nothing. no, no. You mean they, they could that. actually require another side fund to be established? That's what this says right here. I think so, but I, I think because it's based on a percentage of your um, payroll, that's what the side fund is based on, you know, less than 100 employees, based on a percentage of um, your payroll, based on a, an estimate um, accelerator each year that I don't see, I mean, w when I read that, like the golden handshake, I, I don't see the city of Villa Park we would never do that. I don't. I don't think. I don't think that, that would affect us. I really. I mean, with my experience, I don't think that that would. And we don't have the vouchers. We don't do any large plan amendments. I, I don't. I don't specifically foresee that to be an issue for Villa Park. Okay. Now, with PERS, though, there could be a new law saying, okay, now if you have below fifty, we're going to do this. You know, I mean, I can't. <laughs> that's a whole other piece of wax. But if you're t speak, speaking about this letter, I don't think we would have an issue. Thank you. If you kind of feel like you're dealing with a Ponzi scheme and a con when you have that <laughs> conversation. Yeah, right. I really enjoy PERS. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, this is, this is extremely difficult. If this were a conventional contract, a private party, you know, this would be a no-brainer decision. Nobody in their right mind, I, my opinion, would would not do this to save probably a $65,000 net, even after you offset the, the investment return that we'll lose by taking the, the money out of our 1% fund. It's probably still, what, a $65,000 savings? 10,000 plus a year, $11,000 a year. 10, 10 grand a year. Yeah, but- um, 10 grand a year. Which, quite frankly, the way the regular CalPERS payments have been ratcheting up, it's probably gonna just about break even. Probably. I think Seriously. the best thing is to do it. It seems like a decent investment. The stupid thing ain't going nowhere, and um, I'd say do it, my own opinion. So 
my no. thoughts. What, what does the finance committee uh, say about this, Rick? Well, well, you know, this, I mean, this is just, you really can't make a really, really rational evaluation yeah. because the reality is CalPERS is a Ponzi scheme, okay? So how do you invest $250,000 into a Ponzi scheme to get a comfort level, okay? I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the bottom line. This is a much bigger issue at, at FIRE. I mean, it's a huge issue there. And, you know, what's frustrating is, I can't tell you, I've, I've, it, the, the couple of years I've been there, I watched staff come up with this big smile on their face. We balance the budget. You know, we have a great gal down there. She's really good. And I've balanced the budget and all excited. You know, I look at it, I think to myself, well, you know, that's, that's great. You, you balanced it for now. But next year, they can make an adjustment, and all of a sudden, last year's and the year before and the year before are unbalanced. So the reality is you don't have any idea. I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you come out of, of, of a Ponzi investment with any stability? So, you know, you almost might as well go get, you know, some dice. Um, I, I've gone back and forth on this about three times myself. On the one hand, I look at it and I say, well, you know what? If we, if we pay the quarter million dollars, we get rid of the side fund and we're down to what, an 11 something percent contribution rate, okay? Which is great. So that puts us in the pool with everybody else and at least we don't have to deal with the seven and a half percent that we can't earn on the 253,000 that they're gonna charge us. I mean, this will be the one investment that they will get seven and a half percent out of us. So to that extent, my inclination is to do it. On the other side, um, I'm concerned that CalPERS is so unstable, uh, the minute there's a glitch in this stock market, which I fully expect to see in the next couple of years, and most of the brokerage people you talk to, I think, would say the same thing. If the stock market turns, guess what's going to happen to CalPERS? And the assessments are going to go sky high. So now we paid our $250,000 in, and now they're just going to ratchet us up anyway. So, but, you know, but wouldn't they ratchet? I have a they would ratchet both of them up anyway, right? Yeah, well, I wouldn't ratchet this one up, but they but they would certainly ratchet the other one up, you know. And I'm just thinking if it gets bad enough, maybe the state or the Fed or somebody has to come in and bail them out. And then what have we done to Villa Park? We went and paid up in advance all our money so that the Fed or state can come in and bail out Calpers, you know, and and uh, and, and and we end up having lost our money. All of that said, I, as disgusting as it is to me. My inclination is probably to pay it. Um, th the reason being that, you know, I can't factor all that. I can't factor all that in. The one thing I do know is they've got the side fund there, and they're charging a seven and a half percent, and I sure don't expect to see it go away. Right. And it's kind of unique to Villa Park. So I mean, there's other cities, but but there's a, a, a small, limited group of cities that are dealing with this. Correct, Michelle? Okay. So it's, it's a unique See, the billing. thing is, is if we already have a side fund, the chance of them coming in and saying there have been financing changes, so we need to uh, establish a side fund for you or, or reduce. I, they could do I, that anyway. Probably I, will. It, it's, it's, <laughs> I can see both sides of this thing, too. The, the, the positives for me are we've got the money. It's hardly earning any interest. Right. We're not dipping into reserves, which, you know, I go through the roof when we start dipping into reserves unless we have a real emergency. It gets us closer to what is a, an acceptable estimated funding ratio. Mm -hmm. well, no one knows what the funding ratio we, well, is because CalPERS has got a Ouija <laughs> board. No but, one can predict All right, costs. but based on their magical numbers du jour and the fact that the projected side fund payments – could ratchet up even higher than they already are set to do. Right. Because it's, an it's all a projection. And, and we've watched these things just go up and up and up and up. So I would support you if you want to do this. I would, I would love to hear from uh, Mr. Nelson if he has uh, some input on this because he is quite the expert in this area, which is probably one of the reasons why he was the top vote getter uh, in the city of Villa Park. I, I would like to hear what – wouldn't you like to hear what he has to say about it? To be quite honest, when you were done there, I was going to say, Bill, if oh, you, I'm if sorry. you'd like to have your input, I would like hearing it. I would, I would like to hear it. I would love to comment on it. Uh, first off, Mr. Mayor, it's not a Ponzi scheme because it's not going to collapse. 
The taxpayers are going to pay for this. <laughs> They're not going to bid the federal, state. No one's going to bail it out. These are guaranteed benefits. You notice yourself in the Stockton case, they didn't get out of it in bankruptcy. The city is going to pay whatever they have to pay to pay these benefits. It's going to come from the taxpayers is who it's going to come from. To me, this is a no-brainer. Yeah. You're paying 7.5% on a loan. It's just like a mortgage. And, and are you earning 1%? You take this 1% money and pay that 7.5% off. That's it. You, you save $73,000. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was years. that's Everyone that I know that has money has paid off this site for oh, yeah. I, I can't, They paid I, off because it's just, it's just an absolutely a no-brainer from a financial standpoint. Yeah. I, I don't know that I agree with you on the other side it's that this is all going to be paid the by the options. taxpayer. I it, think it, I think it, it may it fall is, apart. It's, it's, no, it is. It's guaranteed. I, I understand that, but it, it's the it, taxpayers are on the hook. Anyone would say the taxpayers are the one that's on the hook. So the best thing to do is manage it responsibly and minimize the risk on the taxpayers. I, I do tend, I, I do tend to agree because although I don't necessarily agree that that's the way it's going to play out, the reality is that's speculative. This isn't, and at least as to this side fund. And you're right, it's six and a half percent. That's what I was saying. It's seven, a big seven and a half percent. So I, seven I and a half percent. I tend to agree. I tend that, to that's, agree. That's what you're paying on. It's just like two decisions. It's just yeah. like oh, a I seven agree. and a half percent mortgage, and you you're paying it off, and you're getting rid of the mortgage. Yeah. And your money that you're paying it off with, you're earning one percent on it. That's right. Great. Yeah. So you can continue to pay it and continue to pay the seven and a half percent, or or you can pay it off. It's still a Ponzi scheme, though. Bill. It's not a Ponzi scheme. All right, scheme. still meets the definition. If you don't pour the money in, it falls apart. It's but not, it's the underfunded. Cities, the cities are going to put the money in. Whatever money is necessary to support PERS, the cities are going to have to pay it. Yeah, it's by you, law, it's a legally it, so. mandated yeah, by law, they, by law they're going to have to pay it. It's a legally mandated Ponzi scheme, right. but it's a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I, what's, I, what's I the next I tend to make a motion. Okay. I'd like to make a motion that we authorize the finance director to amend the employee benefits fund expenditures budget by increasing the retirement expenditures by $254,000 and approve the lump sum payment to CalPERS of $253,525 to be dispersed by December 31st before the numbers change. Uh, <laughs> can I, can I, can I eliminate. I'm just. Oh, on, I'm just on, reading. The we haven't had public comment yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So, I thought we just did. Well, we asked. We invited Bill up, but and there probably won't be any other. Is there anyone else who would like to be heard on this matter? There being none, go ahead. I'm sorry. And then eliminating you. the miscellaneous side fund. Second. Good. Second. It, Greg just seconded it. Okay. We didn't hear right. him. He's over here. Go ahead. I'm back in the corner. Right? Thanks. That's so hard. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilman Pauly. Yes. Councilman Mills. Yes. Councilman Reese. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Fascinelli. Yes. Mayor Burnett. Grudgingly, yes. <laughs> Motion carries. <laughs> yeah. Is that word going to show up in the written minutes? I never, yes. I never thought. I never <laughs> thought I would voluntarily <laughs> commit public funds to a Ponzi scheme, and I just did it. Legally so. mandated Ponzi scheme. Legally, le yeah, legally mandated Ponzi scheme. Okay. Uh, all right, what are we on to? Number nine. Here. Nine? Number nine. Oh, lost my tab here. Oh, my item. Okay. Um, this is yours. Yeah, I know. I just, I, I just thought it might be appropriate to establish a deficit and risk reduction committee. Um, one of the items I think probably would focus on would be the CalPERS items, um, and I'm thinking that maybe that committee could we get some maybe get some outside participation. And also, um, I know I've been in touch with mayors from other cities that are concerned about the CalPERS issue and are thinking about addressing it uh, through legislative channels. And I felt that a, uh, a deficit and risk reduction committee might not be a bad thing to have uh, across the board. However. This would clearly be an initial primary focus, and maybe it could inter interface with some other cities, and maybe we can get something done on this. Would this be a permanent committee you're proposing? Yeah, I think so. Or, or it should it be an adjunct it committee it to the finance ad committee. Ad or adjunct. <laughs> there you go. I mean, I, I think this, this is, uh, is a finance committee falls under that. Yeah, so do I. I think you can also invite other folks in on ad hoc committees underneath that because it's going to be – this is a specific issue we're looking at right now. Yeah, it is right now. Time. You're right. And I, I just thought that it might, it might be the easiest way to handle it. Uh, 
it's not like we're. I, I think it, it's handled in, in the finance committee quite, quite frankly that we don't, I don't need don't a separate really committee well, for we, that. But I appreciate um, that you're bringing it yeah, up, but I, I think it, it should be an be item that is, is re re reported idea. off from time to time would be yeah, the, the appropriate yeah. thing to do. But I, I see your point. I mean, I think it's important. But the, the risk reduction, is this strictly strictly financial? Financial. Or is, it, this is, just or is this also financial. liability insurance uh, or other, no, other I, issues? I, it would be financial financial risk, uh, you know, criminal issues, et cetera. I think you're going to see a motion for another committee on that after the new council is seated. So, but, um, criminal? Crime prevention. Crime prevention. Crime prevention I think, committee. I think uh, Councilman-elect Collicott has um, <laughs> been thinking about something along that nature. Huh. News to me. New stuff coming in. Oh. Anyway, um, I, I, can I just say this? I think using the word deficit is is like an alarm. That that sends alarm bells off. And and if people in the city of Villa Park saw you establish suddenly this deficit reduction committee, they would start thinking that we had problems. And I think well, that that's not accurate. We do have. We, I mean, they're they're not they're not self-imposed. We, we have, have a, we have a Ponzi exposure. scheme. Problem. Yeah, we do. And we're a, we're a, we're a player. <laughs> we're a seven-figure <laughs> player. So, okay. Anyway, uh, you know, I don't know that we even have to take action on it at this point. Um, I just wanted to bring it up and kind of get a sense of the council on it. And frankly, um, I thought it might be a good way to implement it through the other cities. I have not heard back most recently from uh, one of the mayors that was most active on who's came back to me after the election. Mm -hmm. So we can we can shelve this for a while. It, it's fine. And, and if when I hear yeah. back, then maybe we're, we're maybe we'll take a little more action. But on I mean, it. I, I, I think it the, the finance committee could, should take this up. I mean, obviously that's that's right in that. Yeah. Yeah. They that's make true. it an item they well, report. True. Just on. do it as a finance committee yeah. item, and yeah. just that's fine too. I think yeah. that, that makes sense. Okay. All right, so much for item uh, nine on to item 10. Oh, the individual council member items. Well, look at this, it's only 8.30. So if Hallelujah. we don't beat this to death with a lot of uh, show and tell and we just stick to our mandated items, we could probably be out of here at a precedent setting hour. So with that said, yeah, I don't I heard I don't it go off while ago. I think we can hold it under the time, but um, does Making anyone have, maybe we'll start, does anyone have any mandatory reports? No mandatory. How about how about those that feel compelled to make a non-mandatory report? Uh, I didn't go to Victor Control uh, this month because it's coming on Thursday because we are on our third Tuesday yeah, instead of right. the fourth Tuesday. It came up quick so this time. It's uh, nothing's happened since then. Great. <laughs> okay. No reports. Same reason. Um, my sanitation meeting is tomorrow. Okay. And I'll have I don't, to. I don't. Frankly, I I really don't. It's only been my, three weeks. My sense of this, we could deal with this probably with new council, but. You know, I really don't see the point in burning a lot of council time on just reporting for the sake of reporting. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's something material that really affects the community and people need to hear, that's one thing. But just to tell these for the sake of telling that we went to a meeting, um, you know, to me is, is, is kind of pointless. We can, well, this will get, I know this is going to get discussed again. Well, in council, cool, but we have to, I have to report about Vector. That's part of the deal with, with Vector. I have to at least say something about okay. it. Okay. Well, no, that's fine. Our, our council that's is fine. going to help oh, go along ahead. with that. There are certain um, meetings that council members attend for which they receive a stipend that require a Oh, I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I understand that. But that's why I asked if there was any mandatory report. Right. I'm aware of that. So, and anyway. those that we expend city funds to attend as well yes. also would require, right. would trigger that. Correct. It would be nice if it's that they say more than just I attended this meeting. I like the I like the individual uh, council people uh, speaking on mm -hmm. things that they've done because we do attend seminars we think we do attend items that are of no cost to the city and we do that for the benefit of educating ourselves and bringing it back to the people so I, I do like uh, yeah. the fact that we can tell you where we've been and what we've done for the city sometimes it's noteworthy I mean I attended five or six meetings this month I really don't have anything to say on them it, nothing was noteworthy enough to yeah. do it that's um, where I was hit. We had but also, th this doesn't take up that much but time yeah, in the meeting. I, I, I happen to like it. And we're tired by the end of the meeting, so it's not, not yeah. too long. Megan, yeah. I have a question. You know, um, I know we need approval for stipend, uh, you know, to be appointed to stipend committees, but do we, and, and I know that we have to report on anything that the city spends money on, but I received a conflicting comment the other day regarding the need to report on stipend uh, committee activity where the city has no expenditure of funds. So in other words, fire for example right am i compelled to report on fire even though the city expends no funding on it 
because you receive a stipend. But you receive so, a yeah. stipend. No, 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 Other no, than no, that no, no, $1.3 no, or $4 million from our property taxes <laughs> that goes to the fire authority, other than that. I would just like to know on that issue. <laughs> that was standing. If the city does not expend any money, if it's an appointment to a committee and there's a stipend, but it's a non-city so non, it's non -city funds, is there an obligation to report on that or merely an obligation to report on activities the city has funded? If I could review the FPPC regulation and give you, because I'm not sure based on what you're saying exactly how it reads, I'll give oh. you a, a answer. Okay, because oh, I've had I've heard conflicting comments on that. All right. So, uh, does anyone uh, I have, have one thing I'd like no. to report on? Uh, and that has to first of all, I want to congratulate the three newly elected members of the Villa Park City Council. Um, it was a, it was wonderful to have six really good candidates and for the residents to actually have an opportunity to select those of their choosing. So congratulations to Bill Nelson, Bob Cullicott, and Deanna Fasanelli. Um, we will have a, an elected majority beginning next month, and I think that's very important. I'd also like to congratulate the residents of the city of Villa Park once again we had the highest voter turnout of any city in Orange County, perhaps in the state, at 61.7%. Many cities don't even hit 50%. So there was a time when we were closer to 70, 75%. We had a lot of good hot button issues that draw, drew people out, but it's so important for us to turn out and vote. Because we turn out in such high numbers, we can affect the outcome of, of important issues in the county and the region. Um, and I would like to also report on the vote uh, with regard to Measure K, just specifically to the city of Villa Park, because I pulled that data. Um, in the city of Villa Park, the voters, 1,069 of them voted yes, 1,447 of them voted no. So the city of Villa Park rejected Measure K to the tune of just over 57.5%. And I thought that was an important um, piece, a data point for your benefit and for the benefit of the residents of the city of Villa Park. Thank you, that was interesting. Anyone else, uh, no other reports? I don't, I don't have any, uh, well, unless I have to report on the fire authority, so I'll just be safe rather than sorry. I attended a special meeting of the fire authority last, I think it was last Thursday, and we elected a new fire chief. Um, and, uh, Although I continue my frustration with the uh, pension scenario and the horrid underfunding and the deficits that agency runs and the cost, we do have uh, we do have a, a, a what seems to be a pretty good uh, pretty good fire chief, um, good individual, good manager, good communicator, and so uh, if you got to live with the agency, I guess that's the way to that's the way to go. He was uh, unanimously uh, uh, elected, and I joined in that. So. Um, that's all I have on that issue. And do we have anything from staff? Uh, the only thing I got is regarding the sober living facility. Who knows? They have done for the last couple of days. And looks like they're going to for committee mm. as well. So okay. Can we, uh, you, you were involved in to some extent. Discuss a special meeting time frame. We, was that before or after Thanksgiving, you think? Does anybody we need have any ideas? I think we need to find out what how long what they're going to come up with and yeah, see what it is. We could set it. On, we got email. We could set that thing in a day if yeah. we need to. Well, we have to give so much public notice though. Twenty-four hours. Require a closed session as well. Yeah. My guess is if we take any action, it's going to expose us to discriminatory lawsuits. I'll stick my neck out and venture to say it's going to be a very difficult scenario and it's not going to be that quick, easy, or effective. And I hope I'm wrong. So, all right. Well, with that, we're adjourned. All right. I think, I think we just broke a record. That's pretty good. 8.46. Wow. That's never I happened. don't remember getting out of here this early. Do you? Good. I can go home and see my There's kids. Have we done that before? This not this year. Not since I've been on. Not since I've been on. We might have gotten a little.